Uh, principles of surgical asepsis is actually module one. I start with module 1.2 here because I mistyped everything. <laughs> right? So asepsis is the state of um, the absence of pathogenic microorganisms in a surgical setting. Right? And that is what we want to um, aim for when we do our surgeries. Right? But let's um, do a definition of terms first because we are going to discuss uh, some terms na parang magkakatulad pero hindi. Right? Oops, I lost my uh, power. All right. So, a sepsis versus sterility. Okay? Um, one big difference between them is it uh, can be explained by a simple image, right? Imagine this is the surgical site that you want to operate on, right? This patient has a mass on the ventral abdomen and you want to take it out, right? You clip the hair and such. On the skin of an animal, even an us, there could be the presence of pathogenic microorganisms and the commensals or the normal bacterial flora that we have in any body site that we have in our intestines, our, um, our skin, our hair. All right, so a sepsis first. A sepsis would be the absence of the pathogenic microorganisms in living tissue. And we can reach a level of a sepsis using techniques, all right? These are the principles that we do or we implement in a clinic or in a hospital or even in our own house to minimize the degree of contamination of a surgical wound of a certain something, right? That's a septic technique, right? Now we want to uh, remove the pathogenic microorganisms, okay? Let me admit, um, other ones were waiting. Now with um, this section, all right, this is the process of removing the pathogenic microbes, which may result in infection. The, this, the difference between disinfection and antisepsis is saan mo sila ginagamit. Disinfection is done in inanimate objects, on the floor, in our clothes, um, uh, sorry, not in the clothes, in the floor, in surfaces, uh, in the wall, or in certain uh, places. Antisepsis is something that we do um, as a form of disinfection, but specifically for the skin and mucous membranes. That is why some substances that we are um, very familiar um, to would be called disinfectants. Yung mga ginagamit natin sa, sa bahay, sa garahe, sa kotse, di ba? disinfectants. But some of these uh, substances that we use on ourselves, on our hands, you know, lalo na ngayon, pandemic, we call them, uh, we call them Antiseptics, right? Nandun yung uh, difference na yun. Now, if we are talking about sterility, okay, this is the absence of everything, of all forms of microbial life, right? But this can only be used or can be applied in inanimate objects. We cannot render a living thing um, ster uh, sterile in terms of um, the absence of microbial life. There's always going to be something there that makes it a uh, non sterile okay? So, para lang sa inanimate objects. So, I'll give you a clinical case, all right? Let me give you a, a short story where you could choose things. This is Luchi, two-year-old, intact, female chihuahua. Yes, my dog, um, is, the body condition score of this one is getting so fat now because my mom is spoiling her. So, uh, Luchi goes into your clinic uh, with the owner, presents um, for a routine spay, ovary hysterectomy, okay? You get a brief medical history, physical exam, everything is clear. You clear Luchi for surgery the same day. I will give you a choice. Um, Luchi has a choice of a surgeons, okay? You have these two sets. What is the stark difference between the two? Uh, you could unmute. You could chat. I want someone to talk to. All right. What's the main difference between the two? I know it's 1 p.m. It's siesta time. What's in one part? Uh, I'm not. 
I'm not gonna wait for y'all. <laughs> I have a lot to discuss. Equipment. What do you mean by equipment? The things that they have, um, the things that they're wearing, or the things Probably. that. They're... Mm -hmm. Gown, gown, right? Yeah. Mask. Yes. The the just the mask itself is a one uh just one big difference, diba? Right? And you might think in some cases, all right, in some cases, one is acceptable or one is strict. Okay, it depends on where you are. That's why it's a tale of two of two surgeons, right? Because in a small animal setting, wherein um, you want to um, um, implement, you know, a strict implementation of a septic technique, wherein you want to control. Um, any risk of contamination of the surgical wound of the animal's body, you expect that they're wearing these um, attire. Right? You have everything covered, everything in you that could cause contamination, your mouth, your hands, your hair. Um, this one, I think they're doing an orthopedic surgery, so they have goggles on. Well, you have another uh, kind of uh, setting wherein just the use of surgical gloves is enough or is acceptable, right? Shower, shower cap <laughs> is the term. Yeah, it's a hair cap. Um, in surgery, you might see some students before na um, yung cloth, yung gamit, all right? Yung nakatali, that is good as well. We'll have another, um, not a bandana though. You know, it's the cap. Yung nakikita niyo sila sa college. You know, yung mga tapos na mag-surgery. All right. Um, the thing is, uh, you nasa middle, middle, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, you nasa, nasa gitna. That's the cloth kind of hair cap. All right. And meron yung tali sa likod to secure it para hindi siya mahulog, whatever you do. So there's a lot of options for you to institute a septic technique, but there are also a lot of limitations. Like, for example, in a small animal clinic uh, wherein you have the resources to buy all this stuff and you have uh, people, right? When you have a lot of people to cloth because the risk of contamination is directly proportional with the number of people around you. So kung maraming tao sa clinic, more the reason to um, use all that covering. However, let's look at the farm setting as well, right? Let's look at the farm setting. Which it might be, uh, some of you might have a first-hand experience of seeing them doing surgeries. It's not as clean. You know, the term is clean. It's not as um, septic as um, a setting in small animals, right? They do the surgeries in animals na nakashoot, walang coverings, yung iba, uh, wala man lang gloves, all right? So I am teaching you right now what is, um, kumbaga, correct or recommended in the books. But when you go out in the field, when you see a lot of veterinarians in different fields, you will see a lot of contrast wherein um, what they do might strike you as, mm, that's wrong. But you also have to look at their, their perspective as to why they cannot have um, the ideal setting. We rarely have the ideal setting and we rarely can work with the ideal resources, right? um, In class, um, the, the best gloves that I wore are like 60 pesos each pair. I'm not gonna buy that. They're expensive, right? They're expensive. So you bend in some areas. However, in, in the factors that you bend, in the things that you think are okay na wag nang gawin or wag nang suotin, there are consequences to that. It's up to your surgical judgment what a benefit you want to weigh against the risk. Because the difference between the two surgeons could be a difference between the outcome. All right. When there is a high negligence to a septic technique, when you think it's not, you know, it's you can just ignore it, right? You will only see the consequence after we're in mas malaki na yung problema mo. Remember, um, the patients go into your clinic for help, 
They need your expertise, your experience, your technical handiwork. And as part of our oath, we cannot, uh, we do no harm. All right. So whatever you do in the clinic, whatever decision that you do, that is the first thing that you have to aim for. You're not doing any more harm to a patient that comes to you for help. So um, you might not think that the simple wearing of mask, wearing of the hair cap, uh, wearing of the gown, which is actually are quite cheap now. All right. Now you think it's too strict you'll only see the importance and the significance of that, of the simple uh, aseptic um, ways to prevent contamination when your patient comes back with a surgical site infection, all right? And uh, that's why I'm preparing you because you will see a lot in the clinical setting na okay lang yan. I, I'm seeing that as well. Even when I was in college and then I, I worked, everything was different and that confused me a lot. So you have to be, uh, you have to maintain a level of open-mindedness pagdating sa iba't ibang stilo ng clinic, iba-ibang stilo ng doktor. Minsan sa isang clinic, tatlo silang doktor, iba-iba sila ng style. You have to be open to that because once you gain knowledge, once you gain your own experience, you can now develop your own style. And as colleagues, it is ethical that we respect each other's styles. All right? It's good for you to question because you're students. You have to ask them, Dok, but hindi ka nagaganito? Ba't hindi ka nagaganyan? And then they will have their answer to you. Bakit? And that is, speaks a lot about their experience and how they develop their own style. Ba? You just have to be open-minded to it. Kasi meron din namang mga uh, studyante or even colleagues of mine na tipong, mali. Mali yan. Hindi ganyan. Hindi ganyan. Yes, we know that. But you have to understand also their perspective. Bakit nga ba hindi sila nagagaw? Baka kasi hindi nila kayang bumili. Nagsisimula pa lang yung clinic. Diba? So you have to understand um, those things as well. That baka hindi pa nagsistrike sa isip mo na, oh, oh nga, no. Diba? Because we, um, it's the ideal that we want, but it's not, uh, most of the time, it's not what we can do. Diba? We slowly gear for it. But, you know, we have to bend sometimes. All right. The sources of organisms in a clinical setting, okay, not even a surgical setting. Clinical setting can come from three things. Animal sources, so anything that is um, related to the animal, all right? Skin, hair, um, the different uh, entry, portals of entry and exit, or oral nasal cavities, ear pinea, vulva, previous anus. Another um, source of microorganisms would be the inanimate sources, hair clipper, the table that, um, where the patient is, the scrubs that you're wearing could be um, a source of contamination, the drapes, the floor, the walls. These are what we call fomites. And of course, the air, right? Foot traffic, as I've said earlier, mas maraming tao sa surgical room, mas mataas ang risk of contamination. And just imagine if you're like 25 in one section, naka, um, naka confined kaya dun sa surgical room sa college. Just imagine, hindi na gumagana yung aircon dun kasi sobrang um, compact nyo lahat, which is not the ideal setting. Okay? But then again, I always fight with myself. We cannot always have the ideal. So, our goal when we conduct these techniques, when we wear these clothes, when we clean stuff, um, the goal is to prevent surgical site infections. Okay, These are uh, the infections that could happen to the surgical incision that you made after the surgery. So how can we prevent these infections from happening? How do we achieve sepsis or the absence of the pathogenic uh, microorganisms? All right, a variety of ways. It starts with the patient, right? We have to establish the risk the patient has before surgery, okay? Meron na ba siyang existing risk to develop infection before mo pa gawin yung surgery? Does it have any pre-existing medical condition, right? Um, are you going to give antimicrobial prophylaxis? 
um, how do you prepare the animal aseptically? How do you shave the hair? How do you make sure that the way that you prepare it will uh, make it ready for surgery na aseptic siya? Right? And of course, how do you take care of the patient after the surgery? How do you take care of the wound? These are topics that we are going to discuss as we go along the semester, right? Um, especially patient risk, risk assessment, we will discuss that next week, um, along with aseptic preparation and such. For the other part, we're in, it doesn't concern the patient, we clean the environment. And it's not just the place, all right? The specific things, the floor, the table, even the people around the, the animal during the surgery. We disinfect the equipment, we sterilize the instruments, and of course, every person um, attending the surgery who has a role to play in a surgical procedure must uh, be able to um, be aware of the aseptic technique and implement it strictly. So how do we start? Aseptic technique has uh, seven general principles. You do not have to memorize this. This is for you to understand how you are going to apply this in the laboratory. This is our challenge this semester. I am teaching you this now. I'm preparing you for the lab. What I hope for is that you remember the small things um, about the surgery one. Para kapag bumalik na kayo sa school and we actually do the surgery, you know what to do. You are guided. And um, lagi naman sa unang uh, surgery or sa... So uh, first time yung gumawa ng bagong bagay. There is an allowance for mistakes. I, I, I know that. Hindi ko kayo pinapagalitan for that. Pag sa mga unang surgery, second surgery, or kapag sa surgery one. Pero pagdating ng surgery two, meron ng certain level of expectation ang mga prof nyo. Might not be me. Uh, Doc Roda is always a professor of surgery too. Um, I think Doc Lara would be. I'm not sure. Because she is well-versed in surgery. Um, she's she's doing it because she has been in small animal medicine and surgery specialization for the longest time. She's made this in the org. So I, I know her. Um, so medyo hindi na magiging forgiving kapag surgery to na. All right. So what are the seven general principles? All right. Let's take it one by one. So number one, the sterile drapes. Again, when we say sterile, walang kahit anong microorganism. Right, the sterile drapes or, or the cloth that we cover the patient with are used to create a sterile field. Right, and me, I have an order, a specific order of placing the drapes aseptically. Right, so imagine this is the surgical table, the patient is there in dorsal recumbency, nakatihaya, right, ready for you to make an incision. Right, your planned incision is the uh, as in an abdominal incision, um, maybe for, for a spay or an exploratory laparotomy. You are that uh, circle <laughs> at the bottom of the table. All right? Ganyan ang position when you're the surgeon. All right? The patient's head, the cranial aspect, is on the left side of, you, of, uh, of your uh, perspective. All right? However, I'll give you some open-mindedness tip again. Um, it depends um, sometimes if you are right-handed or left-handed, right? Because you make your incision, okay? You make your incision from the, from the cranial aspect to the caudal, okay? If you're right-handed, this is the optimal position for you, okay? Because you just make it like that, right-handed. Okay? But if you're left-handed, that might be difficult, okay? Because you're, you're doing it like that, right? And I always make my incisions left to right, from uh, cranial to caudal, okay? So what uh, some uh, students do is that they position themselves on the other side. And I don't blame them for that, okay? It's just how it is. All right. So the drape, the first drape that you use if you're the surgeon or assistant surgeon is that you place the drape between you and the patient. You cover first, okay, the, um, the space between you and the animal, all right? The next one is that you place the second drape 
on the caudal side of the animal, right? Basically, you are trying to maintain the level of sterility and uh, minimizing contamination doon sa areas na magkadikit kayo, okay? Doon sa areas na posibleng mahawakan mo na. So, sinisigurado mo yon. So, first, doon sa side mo, doon sa caudal side, because you want to cover the anal part, you want to cover the prepucial part to minimize contamination of your um, planned incision area. Because the goal of your sterile drips, okay, the goal of that, to cover it, is that ang makikita mo lang, okay, ang makikita mo lang when you're doing the surgery is the place wherein you're doing your incision. Maybe there's a two-inch margin, but that's it. This, after all your drapes are, are placed correctly, they are secured, that is now your sterile field. Okay? You have to treat your sterile field religiously. Everything that goes into your sterile field must be sterile. You, if you're sterile, when I say you're sterile, nag-scrub ka na, naka-gown ka, naka-cap mask, naka-glove ka na. All right? You cannot work away from your sterile field, which is actually with some of the principles that we will be discussing in a bit. All right? So that is your barrier between kumbaga, the, the, uh, sorry, the septic area, the dirty area, and you, who are your clean. All right? And aside from the animal, you have to be uh, you have to place the drapes on areas where which you will be working adjacent to, pero wala naman dun yung patient. So that would be furniture, um, instrument table, you know, anything else. Sometimes a chair. So it depends on your um, situation. Basta kung ano yung mga lagi mong hahawakan, yung lagi lalagyan mo ng mga gamit, that needs to be covered as well. And only you, if you're scrubbed like her, a gown and such, only you can handle these drapes. Okay? And once you position them, ideally, I add, ideally, the drapes are not to be moved or rearranged. Most of the time, they are. Okay? Especially in a, a surgical setting in the academe, like you guys, madalas, ginagalaw ulit ang drape after. Uh, as a part of a troubleshooting thing. Right? Because sometimes things happen during surgery that you don't want to happen, but then you have to adapt. So you have to move around and move some drapes around to make it happen. Right? Once you're in there, you'll understand. <laughs> okay? uh, after the entire surgical field is created, only the top surface, only the surface of the drape that you are seeing is considered sterile. Yung part ng drape na nasa ilalim na in contact na with the animal is not considered sterile anymore. So you can't touch that sa ilalim. Only the top you can touch. Okay? So as you can see here in the picture on the left, you have an instrument table which is fully draped as well. And um, even when you're gowned, all right, we'll discuss this more in a bit. Even when you're gowned, only a part of your gown is considered sterile once you wear it. That would be the area in front of you, okay, in your chest and a part of your arm. And only the part on top of the surgical table is considered sterile. So wag hawak ng hawak sa kung saan saan once you are scrubbed, okay? I always uh, have this trick um, in the laboratory uh, with the students who are scrubbed already. Na I test them what they do when... Um, when they're challenged with their sterility. You'll, you'll understand <laughs> when we go into the lab. So drapes, what are the drapes that you could use? Drapes can be made of cloth. The cloth ones are reusable, okay? After using them, just put them in the washing machine, clean them, dry them, and then sterilize them, right? You could also have plastic ones, which are disposable. You also can have adhesive plastic ones. Uh, imagine a post-it, Okay, the post it may part siya na, na may adhesive. So imagine a big drape like that na may adhesive sa, sa isang side. And then you stick it on the skin of the patient. So you don't have to secure it or um, para sure ka na hindi gumagalaw yung drape while you're doing the surgery. So that can be done. But they're quite expensive. So a lot of the students just use the reusable ones. If you have scissors or uh, brads na 
tapos nasa surgery and they have that, you can borrow, sa dili nyo ng discard yun. And drapes can be fenestrated, yung may butas, as you can see there, or they can be the normal drape na walang uh, fenestrated. Ah, walang, walang fenestration. Okay? So, number two. Number two pa lang tayo. <laughs> um, the scrap person, I, I gave you a general thing about this already. You can only function in the sterile field. So, the gown front, the only from the chest to the sterile to the table level is considered sterile once you wear it. And for the gown sleeves, only from the cuff, you know, the, the one in your wrist, the cuff, right? To two inches above the elbow. That is the only part of your gown that is considered sterile. So wag kang magahawak sa likod mo, wag kang magkakamot sa yung iba kasi nagkakamot ng ganyan. It's not considered sterile anymore. You have to find someone to scratch an itch in your back. If if you can't control them, that's just how it is, and it's actually um, fun to to see kids who stick with the principles that they find someone to scratch their back, or they lean against the wall to scratch their back. It's just so so freaking cool when when you see them apply what they learn in the lecture. And I know I'll be able to see you guys um, find your way through that as well. Which is exciting, diba? I want you to keep being excited uh, about surgery because this is a, a I don't know, it's, a, it's like a stepping stone in a veterinary school. Feel a lot. So all members of the surgical team, kahit hindi ka, sur hindi ka surgeon, hindi ka magsa-scrub, you have to wear the appropriate scrub attire. So that's the scrub suit. You might see that in the college that they were wearing. Or you could have that now as well when you're doing your volunteer work or work in the organizations, um, cap, face mask, shoes, it's classic. So there's a video on what surgical attire looks like for every team member, which we'll be discussing later. It's in the Google Classroom, they're uploaded there. And there's a variety of videos that my past students made as a project. And we didn't even know that we might be using them for this uh, reason but it's pretty cool they recorded how to scrub their hands how to um you know wear the surgical attire how to use the autoclave so i uploaded that in our google classroom in the google drive sorry and for you to watch because i cannot upload that in youtube because i promised them not to upload it but that i could show it to you as current surgical students number three Sterile must be uh, sterile items must be used in the sterile field, right? So no mixing, and these are products that you use, you know, normally the right? syringes, um, towel drapes, uh, what do you call gauze pads, some some gauze sponges. These are manufactured sterile. Okay, they are devoid of any microorganisms. Uh, when they are manufactured and they are sealed, okay? Whenever there is a tear or a puncture or moisture, pag nabasa yung wrapper, they are considered contaminated na and non-sterile. Now, you can still use them for non-sterile purposes, but if you need to use them in their sterile uh, mode, like the syringe when you're collecting blood, uh, when you're administering drugs, that syringe needs to be sterile, the needle needs to be sterile, when it is in, in contact with a body or with a with a skin or with a mucous membrane, or if it will puncture the body, then that needs to be sterile, right? So you have to check the integrity of these because uh, why um, why am I teaching you this? Sometimes during surgery, you're gloved already, but you need something that is that needs to be unwrapped. All right, that needs to be unwrapped like gauze sponges, another pair of gloves, um, syringe, you might need that. And your nurse must be able to see if the item that you're looking for is actually sterile. So they need to check that, right? So for instruments, right? The instruments that you will be using, okay, can be placed in boxes, okay? Or in trays, like, um, this is the tray, this one. Right? Pwede niya siya dyang ilagay for uh, sterilization. And that needs to be packed or wrapped and wrapped correctly. Okay? Um, in one of the laboratory exercises in surgery, you're basically 
um, wrapping boxes, all right? That's how you prepare them for autoclaving. And you have to fold them in a specific manner. Para kapag binuksan mo siya, you can preserve the sterility of the package inside, right? Hindi mo siya pwedeng balutin lang ng parang um, sa, sa grocery or parang plastic lang, all right? You have to fold the wrapper in a... In, in a, it actually, in a very simple way, para pag binuksan mo siya later, after autoclaving and after sterilization, well, there's no way that you will contaminate what's inside. So how will you wrap that? Okay, this is just a rough um, example of how it's done. The wrapper that you use is a variety. You could use cloth, the square, you know, square cloth, square drape. Or you could use um, paper. You could use uh, Jario. You could use, uh, for, for my class, I don't like newspaper. Dahil yung, the print of the newspaper nagsi stick dun sa, sa drape or dun sa instrument, and I don't like it. So what I had them use is uh, manila paper, which works actually. So how is it done? So you, it must be a square cloth or square paper. You place the box that you want to wrap there. You fold one um, aspect or one side of the of the diamond now. <laughs> there. Leave a flap. That's important. You always have to leave a flap. Okay? Look at her. She folds one side and then brings it back. A part of it. Then she brings it back. All right? That's a flap. All right? You have to leave a flap. For later, when you remove it, when you unwrap this package, that is the only piece of the wrapper that you will be holding. Okay, I'll show you another video for that. And this one you will be doing in class. All right, I will be showing you how to do it. And you will be show, uh, demonstrating it to me that you are wrapping things, right? Which is cool. Okay, you just have to bring a lot of manila paper or jar you for, for that exercise. And you're doing that as a team, as a group, right? And as you can see, it is secured by tape and you leave a label as to ano yung laman and what date you are autoclaving that um, piece of instrument, right? Dito, syempre may label maker sila for, that, um, for those information. For, for us, I just use a marker pen and then I write on the wrapper itself. Okay. So number four, um, once you have these sterile items inside the wrapper and you're not sterile, for example, uh, I'm the nurse. I have to give the surgeon the drapes. All right. I have to make sure na yung nasa wrapper, hindi ko siya mahawakan because that is contamination. So be very careful. And the one important thing is that you cannot toss items across the sterile field or towards a sterile field. Marami na akong nakita na nagbatuhan ng uh, gamit because of the efficiency of it. Dahil kailangan na niya. Tapos malayo yung nurse, so binato niya. Now, if you're good at passing and receiving, then good for you. Okay? But you face a very big risk of dropping things, of harming people, especially if you're not just throwing, uh, you know, um, gauze or drapes, okay? So you have to be very careful when you um, transfer these items uh, with each other, all right? So um, how do you uh, open this one? Remember, this is the pack, uh, surgical pack. So you remove that tape. And you only touch the part of the sterile area where uh, we're in the edges are folded, like um, you saw earlier. Okay. So let's see. So remove the tape. I'll discuss about this tape later. This is an autoclave tape. And you see there's a flap there na nakatak sa ilalim. Right? And this is the nurse. She cannot touch anything that's inside the wrapper. Right? She holds the flaps that were outfolded fold it outward, and she opens up the pack, and everything that is inside is sterile. So she cannot touch that. If she touches it, that's contaminated. They cannot use it. And some hospitals are very strict with that. They watch you as you do it. 
um, as a part of a training protocol. They watch you uh, fold these instruments. They watch you um, call this open them, right? And for this case, in this case, um, she was able to place this um, surgical pack, this instrument, a box on top of a table, right? Pero kung walang table, you have to make sure that while you're opening it, while holding it, you're not contaminating and someone is ready to receive. You'll fully understand this when you uh, do it in, um, in the laboratory, right? So this is one way. The, le uh, the person on the left is the sterile person. The person on the right is the nurse. Um, as you can see, he is not sterile, not wearing any gloves or such. So he has to take care in giving that sterile item towards that person, right? For the peel packages, um, like gloves, uh, blades, uh, gauze, which are packaged this way, um, you can open it carefully without touching the item inside. So same thing like uh, for the inside of the gloves, you see there's a flap as well, na parang dun sa surgical packs. So you can see that um, they are manufactured to preserve the sterility of the item inside. So this one you can touch, the gloves inside you cannot, right? So imagine the, the packaging of the Band-Aid, okay? Um, it's pretty much like that. As you can see, it's a peel package. So when you peel it, okay, it reveals the item inside and the cover, while you're peeling it, it covers your hand. So it works the same way. For blades though, for blades, okay? Um, I don't know if you've seen one. I don't know if you, um, they're packaged like band-aids and they're very, oh, you use this for anatomy. What am I saying? Yes, you know what blades look like, right? Diba? Nandun sila sa peel package. You have to make sure that when you open that, okay, when you open that, a person who is sterile is ready to remove the blade from the inside. Kukunin niya yon with a forcep or a needle holder. A lot of times, all right, a lot of times, I see students, atat eh, marami pa siyang gagawin. So ang gagawin niya ay, bubuksan niya yung blade, ibabagsak niya dun sa instrument table. Bubuksan niya lang niya. Ha. It's lo you're lucky if the part of the blade na tatama dun sa table ay hindi yung matalas na part. Because if it can instantly blunt it, okay, kapag na-hit niya yung table. So um, do not drop it on the instrument table. If you will, if you are gonna drop it, drop it on on top of a sponge or on top of a, a soft thing, but not um, the table or the tray, okay? Because I see I see that too often. And just for um, safety's sake, because blades sometimes bounce, all right? They sometimes bounce off. So if they first uh, land on the table, they could bounce off to the floor. And if you're wearing the Crocs uh, shoes na may butas-butas, you're in a lot of trouble there. Okay? And that uh, Croc thing, um, yung, kung meron mang gumagamit sa inyo nun, I don't, I don't like it. Um, yung Crocs na may butas, I don't allow that in the, inside the surgical theater just because butas siya. Okay? It defeats the purpose of using clogs inside the surgical theater if meron siyang butas. Anything could drop, a scissor could drop, you know, um, a pair of forceps could drop and it could impale your foot. You ask for it when you're using the, those kinds of clogs. For sterile solutions, yung mga suero, you could maintain the sterility of that by pouring it to a sterile container or a bowl. And remember, yung fluids na nasa loob ng IV fluid, they are, st they are sterile. Anything that you administer to um you know, this to patients are sterile, so you have to preserve that as well. Number five, be vigilant in maintaining the sterile field. You can see here how far the non-sterile personnel are positioned away from the draped area, from the sterile field. Okay, That is being responsible in maintaining it. You have to immediately correct if you see anything that's wrong. Even if you're the nurse, even if your boss is the a surgeon, you have to tell them, uh, doc, you touch this, you have to change your gloves, right? And if you doubt any item's sterility, consider it non-sterile. If you're not sure if someone touched it, if you're not sure if a, a small break is actual break or a puncture, consider it non-sterile. 
Now, for some, um, for some clinics, especially if that item is very expensive, the, that item is under guard. You know, it's under lock para hindi compromise yung isang um, item na sterile and then mapapuncture lang yung cover. Hmm. All right. Um, for the patient itself, all right, we're going to discuss patient preparation next week. Okay, how you actually disinfect this area. Um, you have to prepare it as close to the start of surgery as possible. Okay, you have to prepare, uh, sorry, you have to disinfect that area and clean that area um, as um, pinakamalapit dun sa time na magi incise na yung surgeon. And this happened a lot, right? To you na yung betadine, to you na yung alcohol, wala pa yung surgeon. All right? Nakatenga, naka, naka tihaya ang pusa, nagbabantay ang anesthetist, nakabantay ang nurse, pero wala pa yung surgeon at assistant surgeon. Ang tagal mag-scrub. Right? So the nurse has to um, restart uh, the disinfection process again. Because a lot of contaminants could be deposited into that site as uh, kapag mas tumagal at tumagal pa na hindi siya nasisimula. All right, na hindi siya nakokoveran ng drape. Okay? So when you're moving, this is um I'm not going to say rarely done, but um not really it cannot be done kapag maraming tao sa surgery room. All right? The, so when you move, all right, it has to be back to back or face to face if you're a surgical uh if you're a sterile personnel. All right? Because remember, the front is the sterile one, the back is not. So when you pass someone who is sterile, you have to be back to back or face to face, right? And a lot of kids still do this. Um, if I remember correctly, they remember to do this, which is good. You know, which is good. It just makes me smile when they do this. They get a additional in their grade, right? So all personnel must maintain it. Okay, as you can see here, there's this big. Difference, um, sorry, there's my mouse. All right, see the difference between this guy and the table? Okay, you call that the margin of safety and the margin of safety for um, non-sterile personnel and a sterile area is 12 inches. So at least there is a one foot difference between you and um, a sterile thing. That's the distance you have to maintain. Now, honestly, that is not um, observed most of the time because of the lack of space. Okay? Kapag wala kayong space, mas marami kayo, especially what happens in the laboratory, wala na kayong 12 inches. Um, okay, hindi, yun yung nagkakaroon ng argument na, Dok, hindi naman yan ikakamatay nung aso or pusa. Yeah, probably. Probably you're right. right diba? Probably you're right na hindi naman yun ikakamatay ng aso. But are you doing some harm to it? Are you contaminating a part of it? Diba? The smallest thing could be the difference between life and death. And kapag nasanay kayong gawin yung maling bagay, mahirap na i-correct. So dapat sa simula pa lang, masanay kayong na gawin yung tama. Right? And of course, any policy, procedure, protocol that you have in your clinic, if you want to um, you know, put up your own clinic, Everything needs to be informed to everyone. All right? Kailangan um, alam ng lahat yung protocol mo, alam ng lahat how to troubleshoot, and you do not allow anyone who is untrained or not trained well enough to assist you in a surgery na um, alam mong kailangan vigilant. All right? Na alam mong hindi niya pa kaya, then wag mo siyang hayaang pumasak doon. All right? Right. We discussed earlier asepsis, antisepsis, sterilization, disinfection. Um, I hope you still remember the differences of these uh, terms. Diba? So what, do we, what did we say? Sterilization, all, organism, all organisms are gone. Right? Disinfection is the removal of the pathogenic in objects. And antisepsis is for living things. All right? However, okay, pretty standard. Diba? What is cleaning? Right? Is the term cleaning different? Sterilize, disinfect, clean. What's clean? Uh, coffee is uh, cold. Anyway. 
cleaning is the physical removal of surface contaminants with either detergent soap or soapy water in some um, for surgical instruments. Um, cleaning can be done with ultrasound cleaners wherein they use ultrasound waves to clean the small parts of the instruments na hindi kaya ma-reach nung soap, like the hinges. Just look at the hemostat. Yung mga maliliit na siit it okay? They use ultrasound cleaners for that and other methods, okay? So cleaning can physically remove the microorganisms, but it would not kill them. It will not inactivate those bacteria and viruses. Then what is it for though? Bakit siya kailangan gawin? You have this infection wherein you use disinfectants to do the work. You can have sterilization wherein nilagay mo siya sa autoclave, mawawala din naman sila. Then why do you have to clean? Ba? Kapa, um, uh, why do you have to first wash these instruments, uh, remove all these blood or any organic matter? Because those things, the surface contaminants, can become a hindrance for your disinfectants and for the sterilization method to work. They could make them, um, they could deactivate the mechanism of action of those disinfectants or make those disinfectants less efficient, right? Parang sa bahay lang yan. Ang una mong ginagawa, sinisplashan mo ng tubig yung kotse, di ba? Bago mo sabunan, right? Kapag naglalaba ka, binabasa mo muna bago mo sabunan, di ba? Or is that just in my household? Na tipong, um, uh, then, binababan muna namin sa tubig and then saka namin lalagay sa, sa sabon. Right? It's just, uh, it's, sim it's simply like that. So you do cleaning before any disinfection or sterilization to make sure that the disinfection or sterilization method that you use will be efficacious in killing the microorganisms that cleaning cannot remove. All right, I think we're pretty clear with that. So from this to this, um, pretty standard how, uh, sorry, what you have to do. You have to clean them first, make sure all the organic matter are gone, which includes blood, all right? Oh, uh, one question, one question that I have. You have these sets of instruments na puno ng dugo, all right? Na puno ng dugo, okay? You... Uh, you lanced a, a very bad abscess or you removed a very big mammary tumor, madugong surgery, okay? So you wanted to clean it, okay? What do you use to remove the blood? Hot water or cold water? You could answer in the chat, hot, cold, hot, cold. What do you hot. use? Hot, cold, cold, hot, cold, ooh. Quite a variety, huh? Anyone want to tell me why? <laughs> what makes it... Of course, you could wash it with, with any of that. Hot or cold, warm, la la la. But what makes, easy, what makes it easier for blood to be removed is cold water. Okay? Because blood, yes. Because blood coagulates in a cold environment, all right? Okay, hindi siya natutunaw. Okay, hindi siya agad natutunaw. When, uh, you, you could try doing an experiment. I did that too when I was taught that, uh, when I was working as a vet tech, um, na pag nilagay mo sa hot water ang bloodied instruments at ilagay mo siya sa cold, pag nilagay mo siya sa cold, <laughs> okay, Mas, ano siya, mas mabilis siya i-brush agad. Kasi namumuo yung dugo, hindi mo na siya kailangan siit-siitin. Hindi siya uh, dumidikit dun sa, uh, what they call this, hindi siya dumidikit dun sa instrument. Okay? So you use cold water. Alright? Pakakain nyo lang ng lunch, no? Puro pagkain yung mga sinasabi nyo. <laughs> so remember, cold water. Alright? Iba kasi yung pinipilit na tipong warm or hot. Do the experiment yourself. You'll see. And it will be much more satisfying to see it for yourself. Okay, so disinfection. Um, it in, uh, involves the use of different kinds of substances. No, cold, cold. I asked you to do the experiment um, para you could see what really is best. 
try washing the instruments that you use with the hot water. Then you, sa isang um, uh, sa isang tray, there's cold water. Ibabad nyo silang dalawa. Tignan nyo kung anong mas effective. I did the same. Uh, what do call it? I did the same experiment myself. It's pretty cool to watch. It makes your job way easier. Kailangan po ba may yellow? Not really. It just needs to be cold. Right? If you cannot make, if you do not have a cold water talaga, na parang galing sa fridge, or yung um, faucet nyo does not have hot and, hot and cold, yes, it would work to make um, warm water cold. Ah, so it could work. Just needs to be cold or chilly. Okay? So uh, where, where was I? Where was I? Um, liquid compounds, effective. All right. So first, what needs to be disinfected? What needs to be sterilized? Okay. What are the, um, there's a lot of things that we use in the clinic of various functions, right? So let's start with non-critical first. The non-critical instruments are those which um, come in contact with intact skin, with mucous membranes, um, but they're not associated with surgery. For example, right? The, um, the thermometer, the stethoscope, the leads for the ECG, the ultrasound probe, right? These come in contact with the animal, okay? But they're not associated with the surgery, okay? They're not um, associated with the incision that you are making, okay? So they are ideally disinfected um, as needed. Kumbaga, kapag nakikitang um, visually dirty siya, so you need to clean and disinfect it. And um, by standard, when it is used by multiple patients, you have to clean and disinfect it in between use, in between patients, so that there is no transfer of any um, bacteria or microorganisms in between patients, right? This is very important when you are um, in a clinic and there is a, a variety of diseases that you see. For example, naka-isolate ang parvo patient mo and then you have just a normal ancylostoma infested patient, diba? and then you have another one which has distemper. And then you have another one which has a, just a mild vomiting condition. You do not want the things that you use in the parvo patient to be used in your ancylostoma patient, right? You do not want any cross-contamination which will cause spread of infection within your hospital. So these uh, non-critical instruments need to be um, disinfected, all right? Um, depende sa lugar kung nasan sila. Ideally, when you have uh, infectious um, patients, sarili nila yung thermometer, sarili nila yung kainan, may, may parvo thermometer, may distemper thermometer, may parvo stethoscope, may distemper stethoscope. That's just how it is to prevent any spread of infection. Okay? So semi-critical, these are equipment which does not penetrate the body but penetrates some portals of exit and entry, and they must be um, disinfected in a, with a more, what do you call this, matapang disinfectant, or mas madala siyang disinfect. So these are those rigid scopes, vaginoscopes, colonoscopes, uh, the flexible endoscopes, sorry, not the rigid one, um, dental instruments, okay, and endotracheal tubes. Now, as we go into the critical level of sterility, Ito yung mga equipment that will puncture the skin, that will enter uh, through the skin and enter the vascular system. Number one for that would be the needle that you use for, uh, they call this, for veni puncture, for um, collecting blood, for administering drugs, okay? The surgical instruments that you use, they need to be sterilized, okay? And they need to be handled with care and with strict sterile technique. So what are the disinfectants that are commonly used right now since lahat tayo ngayon ay very wary about um, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, ba? Number one, alcohol. Okay? Not uh, referring for any brand. Depends on your brand. Okay? Alcohol. Um, chlorine and chloride compounds. Uh, the basic ingredient would be the sodium hypochlorite. 
you have uh, hydrogen peroxide has disinfect uh, disinfection properties as well. Um, sterilium, which is the most commonly used uh, hand disinfectant right now or antiseptic right now, um, is an alcohol. It's propanol. It just depends on what sterilium you buy. I believe it's 60, uh, 30 to 60% propanol. Um, iodophores, ever trusted, and the quats, quaternary ammonium compounds. Right? So each one of these would have their own mechanism of action. They would have their own properties, meron yang advantage and disadvantage. And everything is summarized in this table. You just have to find the, the specific uh, advantages and disadvantages. Don't focus anymore with OPA, the ortho uh, aldehyde, and the peracetic acid because they are not commonly used because of the toxicity thing. So the first five na lang. Right? So focus on their mechanisms of action, how they actually kill or inactivate the microorganisms and what makes them good for some instruments and bad for some equipment. Right? Sterilization. Okay? So any material which comes in contact with body tissues or blood must be sterile. Okay? Very specific for blood because if there is a um, contaminant which gets into the vascular system, it's very hard to control that because the blood goes everywhere, okay? And sterilization can be done through physical or chemical means. Steam, chemical, plasma, cold. Chemical has asterisk in it because plasma falls under the umbrella of chemical sterilization. Cold sterilization um, goes um, is uh, under the umbrella of chemical sterilization as well. So we'll discuss them. Nang isa isa, okay? Steam sterilization okay, is also called saturated steam under pressure. How does it work? These are what we call uh, because steam autoclaves. All right? um, when uh, the materials that are heat tolerant or, or could uh, tolerate high levels of temperature and pressure, the mechanism is if you put them in, uh, this is like physics 101, if you place them in a container of a definite volume, right? You um, induce a, specif um, a specific temperature and pressure, right? In the correct duration of time, okay? With all those factors in the right spot, you render the contents of that sterile, okay? That the heat itself would kill the microorganisms. Now, there are two different uh, types of steam sterilizers. You have gravity displacement autoclaves, wherein um, the steam, sorry, yeah, the steam is injected into the chamber. The thing is, steam is lighter than air, so it pushes down on the air. And once it removes the air from inside the chamber, the pressure will rise along with it, the temperature will rise, okay? Once you keep them in that temperature and level of pressure, you maintain that for a duration of time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on what you want to sterilize, okay? Instruments, cloth, um, cloth or such, but if it's mixed, it's usually 30 minutes and it's drying time is 15 to 30 minutes, right? So you just put them in the machine, you set the, you know, the setting in this way and your um, instruments will come out sterilized, okay? The pre-vacuum is basically a much more efficient version of the gravity displacement sterilizers dahil hindi na um, maghihintay yung autoclave na mawala yung air. The air is actively vacuumed out para pagpasok ng steam, diretsyo tataas na agad yung pressure and temperature and this can be done in three minutes, right? Very fast. But not really, I don't know, they're not commonly done anyway because they said that hindi ganun kaganda yung sterilization ng mga instruments, lalo na kapag pinuno mo yung um, uh, autoclave, <laughs> right? So uh, with chemical sterilization, we'll just focus on these two, right? It's the use of certain chemicals um, and their mechanism of action towards the microorganisms to kill them. Um, and the thing is, uh, with chemical sterilization, you also put them in an autoclave, but they're quite toxic. That's why um, maraming clinic, they still rely 
to uh, rely on steam ster um, sterilization machines. Okay? But uh, heat, uh, those steam sterilizations, the steam autoclaves, have as one big problem. You cannot use those sterilizations, sorry, the sterilization machine. You cannot use that for autoclaving objects which are not heat tolerant, those which are sensitive to temperature. So that's why you have options. You have the chemical sterilization. This is for the rigid scopes, the laryngoscope, vaginoscope, cystoscope, all that. Um, those need to be uh, sterilized. Okay? The laparoscope, the rigid ones. All right? So, hindi mo siya malalagay dun sa steam autoclave, so you put it in a chemical autoclave. Okay? Ethylene oxide is good because it kills microorganisms by altering the DNA RNA metabolism para hindi siya makapag replicate. Okay? Um, it's a flammable colorless gas, which makes it a very toxic thing. Okay? It's toxic and hazardous to staff. It was found to be carcinogenic. Um, there are claims that it is irritating to the eyes and respiratory mucosa and could eventually cause CNS depression. And you require the machine to monitor these factors to be in the right um, setting. All right? And it takes a long time for um, ethylene oxide to sterilize. Look, it takes three hours. It takes five to six hours. It's just, uh, it takes too long. So the benefits of it is not that good anyway. So most um, clinics and big hospitals would prefer the use of hydrogen peroxide for those instruments na hindi mo pwedeng ilagay sa steam sterilizers. Um, like in those made of plastic, those with, uh, with a camera in it. So during, 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 ginagamit pa rin, sorry, I'm answering a question. Ginagamit pa rin po yan during surgical settings, Doc. Um, do you, uh, is your question is, um, kung meron pa rin gumagamit? Not so much anymore. Not so much anymore. It's okay. Um, not so much anymore, except for those hospitals when I researched it, na tipong meron sila ng machine and then sayang pag hindi mo gagamitin. So um, they still use it, but they're having a hard time now to find ethylene oxide because it's restricted since it is quite, um, what they call this, it, it is toxic and flammable. So ayaw na nilang uh, masyadong gamitin. Pero dun sa machine, they're finding out a way, I think in some countries, they're finding out a way to swap the machines from the ethylene oxide to the plasma. The plasma I've seen done, I've, I've used this one. In uh, when I was working as a vet tech, it was and it was the same uh, machine. The thought now work. We're in the hydrogen peroxide. You pour it on the side. There's a slot that opens on the side, and you pour the hydrogen peroxide. And the instruments that you put there would be the scopes, laparoscopes, the we call this. Um, when we go into the surgical instrumentation, there are some plastic. Uh, there are some instruments you use during surgery which are made of plastic. These are the cautery instruments, um, the instruments that you use to remove uh, lung tumors and liver tumors. Those are reusable, but you cannot put them in the steam sterilizer because they will melt and they cost like 10000 each. So you, you use the plasma. And this is rather um, much safer than ethylene oxide. However, Yung usual na packaging natin for surgical instruments, it wouldn't work here. The, the um, sterilization power cannot penetrate it. So you need to wrap the instruments in this, uh, in this transparent film. Okay, this uh, Tyvek, I think. This is what we use there too. Okay, para sa plastic, dun mo ilalagay yung mga instruments. So um, you also need to maintain it at that. What's good with this one is kapag tapos na yung 45 minutes, you don't need to dry it. Okay? Ready for surgery na agad yung items. And it is safe for everyone. Rather low temperature, 50 degrees. So it doesn't actually cause harm to those um, sensitive to temperature ng mga instruments. Next, cold sterilization is um, basically the use of chemicals as is. Okay? You don't put the chemical in a machine 
and then have the machine utilize it for sterilization. You put the chemicals in a in a in a tray, uh, yeah, in a tray or in a you know drum of, of fluid, or, yeah, and you put the instruments there. Okay. Now, what are the chemicals that you use for that? Um, quas, glutaraldehyde, formalin, peracetic acid. Quite, uh, they call this quite mm, toxic, not really irritating. Right? We remember formalin. Um, they're quite irritating and they're quite expensive when you and you buy so much and you have to submerge the instruments fully, right? So um, the most common <laughs> chemical that is used for cold sterilization, I always use, uh, um, because strictly the term cold sterilization is used for only these four chemicals. But when I, when I studied that, when I was uh, working, Cold sterilization refers to povidone iodine. All right. So, hindi naman lahat ng clinic na nagsusurgery, since this is a core veterinary service, hindi naman lahat yan may autoclave. Some of them would, um, you know, uh, would are still saving to buy an autoclave and they must find a way to um, do surgery with uh, as much aseptic technique as possible, which includes sterilized instruments. So, if they are facing a, an elective procedure wherein they have time to prepare, they could submerge the instruments that they're going to use in povidone iodine. This is pure, not diluted, um, for 10 hours uh, at a 22 to 25 degrees Celsius, and they will come out sterilized. Again, they must be dried um, before using, ideally. But if you don't have time, like for example, you're in a spay and neuter campaign, and you only have one set of instruments. And uh, so you usually have those instruments placed in a, a tray with povidone iodine in it, and you put them there for 10 minutes, and that is already disinfected according to literature. Okay, we need more research on that. Okay, so if you don't have time and such, um, you just place them there for 10 minutes, that's good. And honestly, I'm guilty of it as well. Uh, when I see kids um, do their surgeries and then nahuhulog nila yung instrument <laughs> and they look for me to see if I'm checking <laughs> and then they will get it, <laughs> right? They will, you will see them that they are looking for me. Titingnan nila akong ganyan. Kung nakatingin ba ako sa kanila and then they will um, reach for it. The thing is, narinig mo nang nahulog. <laughs> so I know na nahulog. Tinitingnan ko na sila kung uh, kukunin nila. But there's a way to still use that. Like, for example, a spay hook. Nahulog mo siya because it's so long. Diba? Submerge it for 10 minutes. Then you disinfect it and that's fine. Okay? Easy. All right. Um, let's talk about sterilization indicators. This is the last slide for um, sterilization and disinfection. Okay? Remember the tape na pinang secure ng surgical pack? They started as this colorless uh, tape. And then after, they developed that black bands. Nagkaroon ng color change. Diba? Nag-start as ganyan. Okay. And this indicator tape, the, uh, this sterilization uh, indicator, um, changes color. Okay. It can change color if it is exposed at the right temperature and the right level or amount of pressure. Okay. So you could see na after nung sterilization mo, uh, uh, yeah, after you open the autoclave, you check if nag-change yung color ng tape, then the item is successfully sterilized. However, this is one big disadvantage of this one. You only know na na-sterilize yung uh, tape um, because it was outside. So you don't know if yung loob ng surgical pack ay na-sterilized. So I asked the people uh, then, how do you know if the inside is sterilized? They have another sterilization indicator inside. All right. Now, this are, uh, these are made of paper. You just put them on top of the instruments inside. And they could change in color. The yellow circle could be a blue circle after they are exposed in this uh, setting, 132 degrees for 10 minutes. And there is another form for that, the steri gauge. We're in para siyang, uh, you know, the loading bar, <laughs> you know, like a loading bar. Um, pag na-reach niya yung threshold ng accept, 
then that is good, right? So these are just examples of um, how of, um, the nurses and the technicians and the doctors identify and distinguish if the machine that they're using is working. Because there's a lot of times that ang tagal tagal na kaon ng autoclave, and then apparently it's not working inside. Uminit siya. You actually see steam when you open it, but then when you look at the tape, it didn't reach the temperature it needs to be in. So you need to find a way to figure out that. Okay. Last, last part of the lecture. I'm gonna maximize my two hours. I, I, I'm booked for two hours. I'm gonna maximize it. This discussion on the surgical team is actually included in the laboratory, but I figured you need to know it. All right. Because um, in the normal surgery V SOR 50 setting, the first part of the laboratory in surgery, I use it for lectures. <laughs> okay, because there's there's, there's hindi naman siya agad demonstration, hindi naman siya agad um, magsa surgery tayo agad in surgery one. Okay, I have to um, uh, make you aware of the core of the surgical team, of your responsibilities, of what you wear. <laughs> and such, the specifics of it. That's the first part of surgery one. So I thought I could, I could incorporate some of that in the lecture. And the, uh, one of that is the surgical team, okay? So I'll show you, I always forget that it's moving, <laughs> all right? Surgery is rarely done alone, okay? Even when you go into a spay and neuter campaign and you're gonna tell me, Doc, mag-isa naman kayo na nag-spay. Mag-isa naman kayo nagka-castrate. But I only received the, the uh, when I received the animal, it was already anesthetized. When I got the animal, it was already shaved. It was already prepped. And after I finished the surgery, someone took it away. And they're the ones who um, monitored that animal until it, um, until it uh, woke up. Right? So there's a lot of people working around the surgeon. It's not just the surgeon. Surgeon is just one of them, right? So let me play a video that I saw on YouTube. Surgery service at VSH is special and different for a few reasons. One is that we have built a facility based on some of the best human medical facilities in the world. So we have operating suites that are designed to reduce infection. We have equipment that is new and cutting edge equipment. Importantly, we have specialty trained nurses that help us to communicate with owners if translation is required. They scrub in with us at times on different surgical procedures. So the nurses really are the heart and soul of the surgery service here. We are able to do really advanced cutting edge surgeries now, joint replacements, aggressive tumor resections, minimally invasive procedures where you go in with a camera and take a little look rather than making a big incision into joints or into the abdomen or sometimes into the thorax. Even a dog that's less than one year old that is really suffering from hip dysplasia can have a joint replacement done and um, go on to lead a pain-free, really active life. We can do heart surgeries now. So Really, we are as advanced as veterinary medicine can be. So um, as she has explained, that's Dr. Elaine Cahalin. She has repeatedly um, returned to the Philippines to train for, uh, for certain topics in surgery. I, I did not work in that hospital in Hong Kong. I worked in the hospital she worked first in um, before she established VSH, she worked first in Peace Avenue Vet Clinic, and that's where I worked. Um, and when I applied to her after I graduated, ang, ang ganda niya, <laughs> she was so pretty. She she stayed in the Marriott in uh, in Pasay, and and she came out of the elevator. and was like she's my boss. So pretty. Um, and she's really good in surgery, but she's a monster inside, right? Good surgeons are monsters inside the surgery. But she's very approachable. Um, I met her in Hong Kong as well. And even the best surgeons, even the specialists, they recognize the, the, the people around them okay, as members of their surgical team. But who are these members? What are their roles, right? You have the surgeon, right? The leftmost person right there, that's Dr. Glenn, crazy old guy uh, that I worked in. He's a very bossy guy. 
is Australian. Uh, the assistant surgeon, the doctor in front of him, okay, that's the usual arrangement. The doctor would be, uh, sorry, the surgeon would be on the other side and across him would be his assistant. They're both a gowned and gloved. The anesthetist, you might not be able to see her, but she's sitting on the, on the chair on the far right. She also has a hair cap in it. And the surgical nurse, who is always just on standby, as you can see, monitoring the margin of safety, but always paying attention as to what is happening with the surgeon and assistant surgeon. So let's go into the details about the roles of each one, right? This is another perfect picture. This was a candid picture that showed um, the roles of a surgery team. And maybe, uh, I don't know, later this year, next year, you will see yourself in this same position wherein you do the surgical work and do these responsibilities, right? Let's start with a surgeon. This is Clark, I believe, right? Um, they're finishing now, so there is no drapes. I'm going to defend them on that, right? So the responsibilities are divided between before surgery, during, and after, right? So before. Um, before surgery, the surgeon creates the plan, all right? He creates the framework and the timeline for the surgery, okay? He outlines the workflow for the entire team. He meets them, all right? He meets the the entire team and make sure that everyone knows what is going to happen during the surgery, all right? Since he is the surgeon, he must be able to communicate what he needs and how he needs things done uh, for this patient, all right? He is the one in charge, all right? Um, before surgery, of course, if there are special instruments, special materials that he wants the nurse to prepare, he needs to inform that, uh, inform the nurse that, so that the nurse can have, uh, can prepare, all right? Um, he performs the surgical procedure. He's the one, in, uh, he's the last one in the surgical room. Everyone needs uh, to prepare the animal for the surgeon. And um, you guide the assistant surgeon whenever their assistance is needed. One thing. Hindi robot ang assistant surgeon mo na kailangan mo siyang bigyan ng command para tulungan ka niya, right? It's also the assistant surgeon's responsibility to anticipate kung uh, saan ka kailangan ng surgeon. So it's a dynamic between the surgeon and assistant surgeon na there's a lot of times that they don't need to talk but they know what the other needs and that takes time, <laughs> for you to uh, understand um, what your, your teammate needs without asking, right? Because it, during surgery, I, um, hindi naman sa bawal magingay, but you want to minimize talking because talking, you know, you, you're spewing out your, uh, your saliva there and such. You want to minimize that. That's why during uh, instrumentation, there are hand signals for when you need a certain instrument at para hindi mo kailangan sabihin, give me the scissors. You could simply do that, right? Give me the scalpel. You could simply do that. So there's a hand signals that you that we will learn together uh, when we go back into the school para ma-minimize yung talking, right? Post-operative, after magawin yung surgery, after you feel good about yourself, that you did good for this animal, hindi pa naman tapos ang trabaho. Um, the surgeon actually helps the assistant surgeon do the wound closure. The assistant surgeon ang magsasara ng skin or the abdominal wall, depending on the surgery. So where did my PowerPoint go? All right. Um, you coordinate with the nurse and the anesthetist about the post-op care. Did anything happen during the surgery that might change the original plan post-operatively? You need to communicate them to that. Mean tipong, um, habaan mo, um, dagdagan mo yung dosage na antibiotic. Or dagdagan mo ng pain meds. You know, you have to communicate that with anesthetist um, because most of the time, the anesthetist is not the one making the decision as to um, the changes in the original drug plan or the post-op plan. Okay? And you're the one who will be contacting the pet owners about what happened during the surgery, what you found, 
especially if the surgery is of a diagnostic nature, you wanted to um, know uh, or to confirm a diagnosis, you have to communicate that to the pet owner na tipong, oh, we took a biopsy of the spleen. It's going to take 14 days for the result. Um, we took, uh, we found this cyst on the ovary. You have to communicate them to that. And if there is any change with the original prognosis that you, um, what's called this, talked to them about. Assistant surgeon, um, in this case, uh, assistant surgeon is Joy. If I see that correctly? Yeah, G3 is the surgeon. So as you can see, they are guiding each other. So preoperatively, before the surgery, the assistant surgeon would drape the patient and they would create the surgical field. You would also organize and receive the instruments from the nurse. Yung pag open ng pack ng tama, you're going to be the one receiving that and you organize them for the surgeon. So your knowledge of surgical instrumentation is very vital when you're assistant surgeon. Merong mga surgeon na estudyante na um, ayaw niya, siguro gusto niya mag-take charge so hindi niya pinapatulong yung assistant surgeon na tipong, I got this, I got this. It's up to you now how to figure out that relationship between your teammate and you. <laughs> Lalo na pagdating sa surgery. Dito nagkakaroon ng, um, we call this, the most authentic test between friends <laughs> sa surgery. Right? Because sometimes, uh, I've seen this happen, magkakagroup sila sa surgery one, Magkakagroup kayo sa surgery one. Tight kayo, your friends. Pagdating sa surgery two, hindi na kayo nag-uusap. <laughs> right? Dahil sa mga nangyari sa surgery one. So I don't want that to happen, but honestly, it happens because of how um, you were shaped by the pressures of surgery. Nakita niyo na kung paano mag-respond yung bawat isa. Nakita niyo na kung paano mag-buckle under pressure yung bawat isa and how supportive or how not supportive a person could be. Diba? You'll only know a person until you are fa you're facing problems together. During the surgery, um, the assistant surgeon would visual, um, sorry, would help the surgeon visualize the surgical field better. Um, when there are superficial bleeders, you're the one who's going to manage that. If the surgeon needs you to hold the instruments, you hold them. So basically, everything that the surgeon needs you to do, you do it. Okay. Um, and another thing is you take a mental note of everything that happens because after the surgery, you're the one who's going to do the post-operative report and notes. Now, this is the basically a flexible responsibility because in the clinical setting, number one, your assistant surgeon is not a vet and the post-operative report and notes is done by the surgeon. But for uh, uh, academic purposes, okay, sa setting natin in uh, vet school, the assistant surgeon would do the post-op report. The surgeon will make the pre-op plan, right? And hindi pa natatapos dyan ang trabaho ni assistant surgeon. Um, the assistant surgeon also helps the nurse for the cleanup, right? Hindi po utusan ang nurse, hindi po siya katulong. <laughs> Alright, naglaloka naman tayo lagi sa, ano, sa klase kasi lagi nilang tinitreat yung nurse na katulong. Tipong pengeng pagkain, pengeng tubig. But you know, that's the, that's the role of the nurse. They just, they just take turns. One surgery, you know, person one is the nurse, so aapihin siya. And then next surgery, siya naman yung surgeon, so siya naman yung mga ape. But again, it's the dynamic of your team which makes surgery either fun or a burden. All right, so choose your teammates wisely. Okay, I can't emphasize that more. Anesthetist. As you can see, sa anesthetist, ang pinakamaraming problema at ito ang pinakanakakatakot na um, role, honestly. All right, I'd rather be a surgeon rather than be an anesthetist. So preoperatively, anesthetists would do the pre-op laboratory tests. Um, you do your drug and fluid therapy calculations. I require the computations for that. Um, sometimes there are um, instances wherein anesthetists are not the ones who did the calculations, but um, ko pa rin naman, even when they do that. Um, you're going to place the swero in the patient, which is good. Uh, a lot of you should be 
um, well trained for that. You give the drugs, you keep an organized records of all you give to the patient before, during, and after the surgery. You, um, with the nurse, you secure the animal to the operating table after the prep, and you perform a surgical safety checklist. The surgical safety checklist is a list of questions that I made for uh, the anesthetist to ask every other team member before incision is made to make sure that they know what they're doing, right? Anong pangalan ng asong to? Anong surgery yung gagawin mo? Anong kailangan mong instrument? Nabigay ba yung antibiotic? Nabigay ba yung um, pain meds? Right? It's, it's basically just a checklist to make sure that everything was done before the surgery, before they do incision. Right? Operative, resp uh, sorry, yeah, the operative responsibilities of the anesthetist, you monitor everything. Uh, in this picture, it's Ezekiel. Um, you monitor the vital signs of the patient while the patient is under the drape, right? That's the biggest challenge of all. You cannot see the patient, right? Sometimes you could see the head, um, but most of the time the patient is under the sterile field that you created. So they have to find a way to measure the temperature, the heart rate, the respiratory rate. If there's a machine for some clinics, um, they could measure blood pressure and oxygen saturation. These the refers, uh, th this will give you an idea of the anesthetic depth of the animal. Nagigising na ba yung hayop? O masyado na siyang natutulog na baka mag-overdose siya dun sa anesthetic drug? So this is why um, the, the anesthetist ang pinakapawis <laughs> during the surgery. Dahil ayaw niyang biglang um, hindi na lang magising yung pasyante. Alright? So both operatively, you continuously monitor the vitals of the patient until full recovery. Let me give you an insight as to what happens commonly, commonly happens during uh, this setting. The schedule of surgery, I don't know why it's made that way. The schedule was done na meron silang klase after surgery class, right? Tipong ang surgery class nila ay, for example, 1 to 4 p.m. Then my classes sila ng 4 to 5.30. Sure, I don't know why. Mm. Um, so, bibilisan nila yung surgery para makarating sila dun sa klase nila, which they might have a quiz, they might have an exam in. So, ang nangyayari, hindi pagising yung pasyente, iniiwan na nila sa cage or sa bag. And there's sometimes na... Uh, there are some instances na nagko-collapse yung pasyente at walang nagbabantay. And I hate that. I hate that. Dahil paulit-ulit na lang si Doc na nagsasabing, bantayan ng aso, bantayan ng kusa. Huwag iwan mag-isa. And then you find, you know, I find the patient collapsed. Then I'm screaming for people na tipong, nasa nang ano nito? Nasa nang gumawa? Nasa nang surgeon? You know, so be very wary. These are these are animals. They have owners, and again, do no harm, diba? Imagine these are your dogs. How hard is it to bring the cage to the uh, what they call this to the room of your next class, diba? I've already uh, asked um, the schedules to be more, you know, um, flexible. Pagdating sa surgery, kasi lagi naman tayo nag overtime, okay? Normal sa so surgery na go overtime. I think the latest that I uh, stayed for surgery was like 9 p.m. Right? Um, just because, you know, some complications happened or biglang bumuka yung tahe, so I had to be there for when they repair it. But it happens, you know. That's the normal, uh, no, um, we call this normal story for a veterinarian. But what is important is, Wag nyong iwan yung mga pasyente nyo hanggat hindi pa talaga sila gising. You have to make sure that the meds that you give were given um, talaga, that it's working. Because some, um, some dogs or some cats wake up and they're in very high level of pain that you could hear them screaming and there's no one taking care of them. That I have to knock on the door of a, you know, of a class to ask, Kaninong pasyente yun? Hindi nyo ba naririnig na umiiyak siya? Okay? But I already gave the drug. <laughs> because it's, it's so easy, easily done. So, surgical nurse. Isa, isa rin sa mga pinakapagod. 
Pero ang nurse kasi, pagod to before and after. Hindi during. Pag, uh, during the surgery, medyo petix si nurse. Alright? Usually, ha? Usually. Um, before the surgery, the nurse prepares everything. That's the surgery room. He prepares the surgical gown, the drapes, the instrument packs, the gauze packs for autoclaving, and they would autoclave it as well. Um, they would open the surgical packs for the surgeon. Um, they assist the surgeon and assistant surgeon during gowning and gloving. Um, and they prepare the dog or the cat um, for, uh, what do you call this, for surgery. They shave the hair, they clip, um, they make sure that it is clean, they remove all those debris, they start disinfecting with povidone and alcohol. That's all the nurse. But he does that, he or she does that with the anesthetist. Because you only prepare the site once the patient has been anesthetized. So, nagbabantay si anesthetist, nagpre-prepare ang nurse. Right? So, um, during um, the surgery, again, medyo petics ka, pero lagi ka lang naka-standby. Alright? Lagi kang dapat aware as to what is happening with your surgeon and assistant surgeon if a, and if they need help. Usually, ito rin nurse... Um, Siya ang nag-aayos ng hair cap at mask ng, ng surgeon. Siya ang nagpupunas ng pawis ng surgeon and assistant surgeon. Siya yung nag arrange ng position ng, um, ng animal. So basically, kung saan ka kailangan, nandun ka. And um, honestly, the nurse is the one handling the camera during surgical procedures. Totoo yun. <laughs> okay? Dahil siya yung hindi scrubbed, meron siyang fanny pack na nandun yung mga um, instruments or eh, sorry, yung mga materials na kailangan niya. At siya rin yung nagtitake ng pictures during the surgery, which I am good with. I did that too, pero bawal sa amin na nung college ang magpicture during the surgery. But you could take pictures after. Alright? Yung tipong mga nag nagsasara na lang ng, ano, ng skin, go take as much pictures as you want because during surgery class, dun kayo naka-attire. You want to be proud. You want to show your parents na look, ma, um, nag-surgery ako kanina, look, ito yung mga pinabili natin ng, ng OR gown. Nasuot ko na siya. So, I give you all that, um, that, uh, you know, that ability to, to take pictures, but do that after, when you're done with the surgery or kapag nagsasara na kayo na yung hype ng surgery ay medyo uh, nagmemellow na kasi patapos na kayo. Alright? It's totally good. Um, as a nurse, you organize the instruments for cleaning. You dispose of the sharps and wastes into designated containers. Basically, the cleanup. Right? You transport it with the anesthetist. And the most important thing, you are in charge of post-op patient care and management. Right? So, there's this uh, overlapping of responsibility sometimes. Um, with uh, the nurse taking care of a patient. Because sometimes, halimbawa, yung surgeon yung may-ari nung aso na sinergery nyo. Okay? Si nurse, uh, they call this, um, siya dapat yung mag-aalaga for um, the next days, di ba? Kaso, yung may-ari, yung isang studyante naman. So what they do is that si surgeon ang mag-aalaga nung sarili niyang aso, but the nurse needs to routinely check the animal, check if kumakain, check the animal if the wound is okay, if the wound is clean. Um, they call this monitoring for any signs of infection or inflammation. The administering of drugs, you also have to make sure of that. So merong interplay. Tipong hindi naman siya strict na tipong, um, ako, ako kailangan mag-alaga niyan kasi ako yung nurse. I akin yung aso. <laughs> Alam mo yun? So, um, doon nagkakaroon ng bending. Naiintindihan ko naman yon. But uh, one thing is that you have to present the animal to me one week post-op. Now, there's this, uh, hindi niya naman siya kailangang ipakita sa akin, especially if the case is yung tipong, uh, ano yung mga case nun? Taga Maynila yung aso. <laughs> Dinala sa indang para ma-surgery. Kasi ang may-ari nun ay kaibigan na, nung surgeon or jowa nung assistant surgeon. Alright? So hindi nyo naman kailangan dalhin ulit yung aso papu- mula may nila papunta sa akin. The pictures would do, usually I would ask to talk to the owner to ask about the patient. Kumakain po ba? Nabibigay po ba yung gamot? So I, I do my, ano din, 
my um what do you call this my part to check on the patient kasi ultimately kahit kayo yung gumawa ako ang supervisory sa so kapag may namatay din ako ang kumakausap sa owner kapag may nangyaring masama ako ang <laughs> ang sumasagot because i'm i'm the one monitoring you so in you know in retrospect um everything that you do diba everything that you do would also be answered by me Okay? So ideally, don't uh, F up about that. <laughs> right? Nandito naman ako lagi kapag may problema during surgery. What I hate is when I'm I'm called, okay? Tinatawag ako kapag malaki na yung problema. Okay? You, they, you try to hide the problem until it's too late for me to fix it. Mayroon yung tipong dumadakot na ako ng dugo, wala na ako magagawa doon. Right? So kapag mayroong problem, tawagin ako agad. If uh, wag wag ang tipong um, okay lang yan okay lang yan you don't know that diba? you don't know that so be very careful when you do the surgeries and as we go along and you gain more knowledge i believe you will be ready once we're going back to school all right so the, the dynamics in your team so just one of the teams i handled they love pictures you know the 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 the, the whole class loved pictures so i asked for their pictures to use for my future classes, which I'm very thankful for them. All right, this is the end of a very long lecture. Thank you guys for uh, watching through it as I rant and all that. Um, next week is, uh, we're going to discuss uh, patient uh, preoperative guidelines, okay? What do we do before surgery? What needs to be done? What needs to be checked on the animal? How do we stabilize a patient that needs uh, stabilization? So um, the files for this will be posted um, right now. Kailangan ko lang siyang i-upload and get the links. I'll wait for them in the Google Classroom. And if you have any questions, feel free again to um, post them in the Q&A threads that will be posted in Google Classroom. All right. So thank you for uh, joining me. <laughs> for this lecture. I hope you have a good weekend and a more productive next week. Mm -hmm.